Welcome to Ladies Talking Leaves. I'm Chris. And I'm Syl. And we have a jam-packed show for you today. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be a leaf fan. So let's get to it. We're just going to go uh, give you an overview of what we're going to be covering today. So we're going to talk a little bit about training camp. We're going to talk about the captaincy and all of the uproar about that. A little bit of insight into our 2019-2020 schedule and a new segment for you today called Heads Up Ladies, which is going to give you a little bit of insight into new things that might be going on with rules, um, anything to do with the league in general, uh, just uh, information just to kind of give you a heads up as to what we can expect. Yeah, and heads up. Mitch Marner is signed. <laughs> All right. Finally. Thank goodness. That's not a heads up let's say, part of the <laughs> segment, but uh, yeah, no, it's exciting. Definitely that he's finally signed. Dubas did, got it done for us. And um, yes, we have four guys that are signed for out of four, half of our sa- salary cap. But um, I mean, you got to do what you got to do and we got it done. So we got to move forward. And thankfully we... We, we just have to look forward to the upcoming season and not think about negativity. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm a little tired of all of the, you know, the uh, basically our, the couch GMs uh, yeah. trying to, you know, figure out how we're going to keep these people going forward. But you know yeah. what? That's not our problem. We don't have to worry about the money. They got the money. Yeah. They've got the brains in yeah. the operation, uh, they're going to make it work. So uh, we're not worried. We're just happy that we're going to get to watch Mitch on the ice uh, creating his magic again this season. Yeah, so pop the champagne bottles, although we're just doing it with Diet Coke, of yep. course. That's our that's our <laughs> drink. Me and Syl love our Diet Coke. Um, yeah, so let's get to it into training camp, basically. All right, let's yeah. do it. Um, so lots of stuff, actually. We're going to just basically go through all the positions here. So... First of all, we're going to take care of the defense. So the top two D pairings, I think we have basically have them set. It's going to be Muzzin, Jake Muzzin, and Tyson Berry on the first pair. And then Riley is going to be with uh, Cody Cece on the second pairing. And um, that leaves, of course, Travis Dermott is out with injury probably for maybe 14, 15 games of the season, the first Mm -hmm. part of the season. So that leaves basically the bottom two and the third pairing um, open. So there's lots of options there. Once Dermot comes back, like definitely he has a spot there and he could even move up to the... To I'd, I'd like to see him on the, the top pairing, give yeah. him a shot there. Yeah, but um, but for now, there's the two spots there. And I think because going into next season, basically the scary thing is that we only have... Um, Riley signed basically beyond <laughs> this season. Um, that so, is a little frightening. Yeah. So we really need, I think, though, what Dubis and Babcock are hoping is that somebody from the Marley's organization comes up basically and proves that they should be one of those, um, one of those defen- defense guys. Yeah. And I think definitely um, this training camp is the time for them to kind of get a look and see who's going to be able to step up. And yeah. uh, so far I've heard good things about Rasmus Sandin. Yeah. Um, and I guess I know Lilligren, uh, Timothy Lilligren has a little bit more um, experience uh, yeah. being with the AHL club for two years and winning Calder Cup with them. But um, I think they're going to be looking hopefully to be able to uh, advance one of those two guys within the next couple of years for sure. Yeah, because you, you definitely need 8D anyways, I think, uh, for the season because there's always injury that comes up too. Dermot Absolutely. is going to be out now, but in the playoffs, you always need that, um, you always need the extra defense guy. So hopefully um, either Lilligren or, um, or Sandine. Mm-hmm. Sandine, personally, I think is a bit too young, but anyways. <laughs> well, you never know. Yeah. You could make the leap. Yeah. Um, one thing I know I do not want to see is uh, oh yeah, is <laughs> Yeah. Um, no. Enough said about that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Babcock definitely likes that guy, I guess, because it's because uh, of his size. But uh, yeah, I've I've seen just about enough of that guy. So yeah. I, he's he seems like a nice person, <laughs> but I don't I don't yeah. really. Uh, yeah. I'm hoping he doesn't get too much ice time this yeah, year. I'm not a huge fan. Okay, now on to the forward line combinations. Will we have any surprises? I don't know. I doubt it because we have mostly uh, the first two. Not for the first two lines. Yeah, first two lines are a lock. 
yeah. kind of like the the defensive top two pairings. So we're going to have Matthews centering uh, Nylander and Janssen. And then we'll have uh, Tavares, Marner, and Kapanen uh, will be filling in for Hyman for the first little while until Hyman gets back. After that, Kapanen will probably move down to be centered by Alexander Kerfoot and then uh, possibly Trevor Moore on the other side. So then really the last... The third line is, the fourth line is going to be the line yeah. that is going to yeah. be most the, up for grabs, and there's a lot yeah. of yeah. people vying for those spots. And yeah, that's the depth players, basically, and that we need that can play on the fourth line, possibly third line as well, mm -hmm. um, but to be, be able to move up and down the lineup. So Dubas has really done a good job there, getting a lot of options, whether they be on professional tryouts or signed to league minimum contracts in the seven to 800,000 range. So that's like uh, Nick Patan, Nick Shore, uh, Kenny Agostino, uh, and Ilya Mikheyev, mm -hmm. who's uh, we talked about in our last first episode. And um, yeah, he's becoming one of Bab's favorites, apparently. He calls him Mickey already. So, so the, the he's media, definitely going to make it. Yeah. He's got a nickname already. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so the, it'll uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Spezza and because. Uh, Gauthier apparently is still in the mix as well, Freddie Gauthier, so mm -hmm. for that center fourth line role, but um, we'll have to see how it goes. Okay, now on to the goaltending position, and we obviously know Freddie Anderson's the number one, but it's the backup goaltender that's really been the question mark for a couple of years now. Yeah, it's it's yeah. interesting that that's usually, that seems to be the talk of uh, preseason, both seasons, Yeah, uh, trying to figure out who's going to be the the reliable backup, uh, and, especially now that they got rid of a couple of, of good standby people last yeah. season. Yeah, and getting Babcock's trust, obviously, too, as the backup is, yeah, is, absolutely. A, is a thing. So, um, yeah, so hopefully Michael Norvorth, I think, is the leader uh, in that category to get the backup role. But unfortunately, he's now injured, even though they don't really say if it's what it is. But um, so it... it it might possibly be Michael Hutch Hutchinson, but... Um, yes, it's, it's yeah. unfortunate because Neuwirth, when he is healthy, he is he can be really, really great. Like, yeah. he actually, I think for a time, he was thought of as potential number one in the league. So yeah. he, he could be really, really good for us and, yeah. and someone who can really spell uh, Freddie some time. But it's the injury considerations and... From what Babcock is saying, it sounds like he kind of would like him to kind of push through a little bit. But um, anyway, um, bottom line is Freddie needs probably to play between 50 to 60 games mm -hmm. and he needs to be fresh for the playoffs. So they got to find somebody that's reliable and has Babcock's trust to get the job done uh, to play those 20, 25 games. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so on to the coaches. Um, so we do have some a uh, couple new coaches yeah. in the fold this year. So we have uh, Dave Hackstall, who used to be the head coach of the Philadelphia Flyers, and Paul McFarlane, who has a, a varied background, but uh, most recently he was an assistant with the Florida Panthers. Um, they both bring an interesting mix of experience. Um, Paul McFarlane in particular was uh, is considered a sort of a power play specialist. So they yeah. really brought him in to kind of help us, you know, give us some different looks, a little more creativity, I think, so that our power play can can be uh, quite the killer that it was at the start of last year. Yeah, because yeah, he's uh, Florida was number two in the league in the power play. So obviously that's what uh, we're hoping that he brings to our power play mm -hmm. as well. Give us some different looks and that. Um, and then Dave Hackstall, of course, was with the Philadelphia Flyers for three seasons, and he's going to be handling the defense and the penalty kill, which is going to be a bit of a in <laughs> work in progress because basically our main penalty killers from last year are all, are all on the Ottawa Senators now okay. <laughs> in Connor Brown, Zaitsev, and Hainsey. So, um, yeah, so he's going to have that part of it to um, to deal with. Yeah, that's something that I, I, one person we didn't talk about with the defense is Ben Harper, who we did get uh, from Ottawa in that trade that sent Hainsey and uh, Zaitsev there. Um, he uh, did a lot of penalty killing um, with Ottawa, so and he's a big body, so I think they're kind of hoping that maybe he can kind of step into that role here as well. 
Yeah, as long as he can skate too. That's that's, (laughs) it's speed needs to be seen. Speedy. (laughs) I don't know being that big, but you never know. Yeah, he could. There's a potential there. Okay, so on to the captaincy now. Yes, yes. We do have some differing opinions on (laughs) on this topic. Yeah, but I do think I'm kind of coming around to more your point of view. So. I know, Chris, you think that yeah. it's very important that we do yes. have a captain yes. going on forward. Yeah, I'm very much into the history of the team and just, I'm old school, I guess. I like a lot of the uh, the history of the NHL and, and the Toronto Maple Leafs, obviously. And I just think it's important to have a captain. It's just a connection that there is with the fans um, and the community. And I mean, you look, look at all, like everybody knows Daryl Sittler, Doug Gilmore, Wendell Clark, um, Rick Vive, um, there's, there's, those players are in Maple Leaf history forever. And I just think mm-hmm. it's important. Obviously in the room, there's going to be, um, the team as they have it here, mm-hmm. or like the, uh, <laughs> leader, the leaders Leadership club. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sort of thing in the room, which is fine. Um, but I just think it's good to have the one guy who, who basically answers for the team. It kind of, takes pressure off other guys um in in the room to be that guy to answer to the media and be that leader for the team in general Mm -hmm. but having said that so my my choice is morgan riley i know most likely it's going to be austin matthews but uh and i have no problem with that because he is the franchise player he's the face of the franchise Mm -hmm. but um but I think personally, Riley has been through a lot, so yeah. I just think he's the he's the better choice. But well, I I I'm all for Morgan Riley as well if they're going to name a captain, which apparently is is coming down the pipe. But um, I I I've been of the view that I don't really think it is necessary um, or needed, like I guess in quotes, uh, because we do have that excellent leadership group in, um, in the locker room. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got, you know, the Tavares, Matthews, Riley, Marner to another extent, some really good veterans, including Jason Spezza now. So, um, I do think that leadership is definitely covered off well, um, as far as, you know, the history and connection. I, I do get that. And now that I know that they are going to be naming a captain, I'm finding myself much more excited because there is, you know, there's quite a lot of fanfare and, um, you know, celebration involved, especially oh, yeah. because it's the Leafs. Yeah. MLSC so. is definitely going to make a big show for this. For sure. For <laughs> it's sure. Been, and, uh, and it's so been three seasons since we haven't had a I am captain, pretty excited so. to, yeah. to see that happen again. Yeah. And, um, but you know, I do know also that the, you know, the, the league is now filled mostly with millennials and demographically the millennials, they like to do everything in a collaborative way. So I do think that's part of the reason why they have had a hard time, you know, picking a person too, because no one really kind of likes to set themselves that far apart from other people nowadays. So they like to do things as a team and in a committee. So I I suspect that even if there is a captain, that there's a lot of that is still going to happen. Um, but if they do name somebody, which I suspect is going to be Austin, um, I can see that he's ready for that now. And like, you know, coming into this season, he's got even like, he had a little bit of extra swagger last year, but I'd see, I see even more of that now. And he's for sure the most popular. Like they, they said that, you know, on the rock when they're doing their, their preseason, um, you know, 90% Austin Matthews jerseys. So he's Mm -hmm. super popular. And I think that he's going to do a great job and he's got a really good, you know, team of supporters in the locker room to help him as well. Yeah. And personally, I don't care about millennials and their (laughs) thinking. They have to look at the team that they're on, the Toronto Maple Leafs, and go with the team history. And that's it. Okay. (laughs) Well, in that case, let's move on. on. (laughs) So now we're going to cover off a little bit of the highlights uh, coming into the season. Um, We are really big on, uh, you know, kind of taking a, an overview of looking at the schedule at the beginning of the year, because, you know, uh, we are big on, you know, for example, taking road trips. We like to, to do a lot of those things and, you know, we'll regale you with some of our stories from, uh, road trips past, uh, at another time. But for now, we're going to take a look at, uh, some of the highlights of, uh, games that you might want to look forward to. Yeah. So to start, we have 
12 back-to-back games, four in October, so good to get those out of the way, obviously, mm-hmm. when we have fresh legs at the start of the season. Um, and then the it's almost a 50-50 split, actually, on Saturday night games, whether they're home or away. So yeah, and I guess that's because the Leafs are a big draw yeah. on the road, so yeah. they like to get them there on a so Saturday uh, so national audience. Yeah, so it's 13 at home, 11 away. Um, the last half of the season, they're basically playing every other night. So get ready for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> with the exception of the bye week, which is from January 13th, sorry, January 19th to the 26th. So that's when you can plan if you guys need a break, uh, <laughs> that may be the time to go down south. And who knows, maybe you'll see Willie down there, or Austin. <laughs> no, actually yeah. Austin. Oh uh, yeah, no, that's right. Cause the all-star game will be after that. So yeah. Yeah, and then in um, the longest road trip is uh, five games in November, from November 16th to the 29th. And then, uh, yeah. And then some games to mark on your calendars, obviously opening night, which is, by the way, the day that this (laughs) podcast drops, so stay tuned. Um, Opening night is going to be against Ottawa on October 2nd, and unfortunately, it's a Wednesday night, so, uh, but... It's hump day, so I guess it gives you something to look forward to coming yeah. up Saturday, which is our tilt at home against uh, Montreal on October 5th. Then on October 7th, which is the following Monday, we are right right into it against the Stanley Cup champs, uh, St. Louis Blues, and Bozy uh, returns again to visit. Yeah. And then on the 19th, we have uh, our favorite rivals there, the Boston Bruins, Saturday, October 19th. And then on December the 4th, we have the return of Nazem Kadri with the Colorado Avalanche. Yes, and that, that will be a bittersweet night for sure. Yeah, yeah. And um, and then, oh, and then we have a New Year's Eve game in Minnesota. So if you have any New Year's Eve party plans, include the Maple Leafs, watching the Maple Leafs that night. Or if uh, or, you are so inclined, you yeah. can go to Minnesota and uh, spend yeah. a wild night in Minnesota for New yeah. Year's Eve with the Leafs. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, and then just a note, just the final game of the season is versus the Habs on April the 4th. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that's a home game. Yeah, and that's a home game. So as far as road trip possibilities go, we always take a look to see what are going to be the prime dates. Uh, you're looking for, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sundays to so make it easy for yourself. Um, so uh, the first one that comes up is actually on Saturday, October 12th. So that would be Thanksgiving weekend for us here in Canada versus the Red Wings. Um, it's in uh, Little, Little Caesars Arena, which is the newest um, uh, newest arena in the NHL, it was just opened in 2017. Apparently, it's like a super super awesome place yeah, to see I've a game. I've heard it's really really great place to see a game. So yeah. that's definitely one to earmark, and it's early on enough that you're not going to end up with too many um, weather issues if you're going to drive yeah. that uh, 401 corridor down there. Um, another great uh, opportunity. It, always is to go to Montreal to yeah. see a game and uh, watch we've, the We've Leafs been there the several Habs. times. <laughs> yes, so that's definitely yeah. a must yeah. do. Yeah. Um, and to see them uh, at the Bell Centre. Yeah. And uh, this year you can see them there on October 26th. So yeah. again, it's not, you're not worried too much about really inclement weather. So it's <laughs> going the other year. direction on the yeah. 401. <laughs> Trust us, you don't want to go in the middle of February when there's snowstorms. Yeah. Been there, done that. Yeah, uh, we still had a great time, but uh, <laughs> yeah, some unfortunate weather uh, mishaps. Yeah, um, and then there's a couple more dates in the second half of the season. Yeah, so there's the Sabers on Friday, November 29th. Now that again, it's within our vicinity. There are rivals down the QEW, and you may have some weather conditions there. Mm-hmm. But uh, being in Western New York, but um, it's always a fun time going to see the Sabers. It's just a different atmosphere being all Leaf fans. And um, and you can do this one without even having to yeah. really worry about an overnight if you didn't, didn't really want to do that. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and then Saturday, March the 14th, which I think is during the... Um, March break? Yes, March break. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, versus the Bruins, so I think it's a little bit farther, but it's during that time where you might be able to, to to go down to Boston and try and beat our rivals there. And yeah. And then, and then if you uh, are so inclined and you want to see a string of games and maybe, you know, 
put together a week of travel for yourself. Um, we always like to kind of look at some, you know, West Coast trips that you can do. Last year, we did a fantastic trip uh, to Vegas and Phoenix, Arizona, and it was amazing. Yeah. So if that ever lines up again, keep a lookout for that. That's definitely yeah. worth doing. Seeing a game in Vegas, it's it's definitely leave Vegas. It's a show. It's yeah. so fun and so worth, worth doing. Yeah. But this year, it's lined up really well to go in March. Uh, to do the California trip. That's one that we've been kind of looking at uh, doing for some time. Uh, unfortunately, not this year. <laughs> but um, but it does line up really well if that's something you want to do. Uh, March 1st, uh, you could see the sharks, maybe do a little bit of touring in, uh, in the Napa Valley and then come down to L.A. for March 3rd uh, against the Kings and then March 5th against the Ducks. So it's, uh, it lines up nicely to be like a nice week-long uh, trip out uh, California way. Yeah. All right. So that's it for the season schedule. And um, now we're going to take a look at our new segment. Oh, yeah. Heads fun. up, ladies. <laughs> take it away, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I kind of created this sort of thing because I think it's important to know about rules of the game and just stay informed on league stuff too. the stuff that affects the overall uh, like all of the teams, basically, that's important. And so, it does, it, it helps with enjoyment if you kind of know, you know, why certain things are happening yeah. um, on the on the ice and off. Yeah, and um, so, yeah, so the, it's obviously, we're not covering everything here. If you want to see everything, just go to NHL.com. But the main, <laughs> the main points that I found interesting for the game that are the rule changes for the upcoming season are to do with the coach's challenge. So currently it's for offside. You can, the coaches can challenge the offside and the interference on the goalkeeper. So now there's going to be a third category allowed for the coaches challenge of goal calls on the ice that follow plays in the offensive zone that should have resulted in a play stoppage, but did not. Okay. So that's a mouthful, but now I got a couple of examples for <laughs> you. Um, and particularly in big games where, where this rule would have helped. Um, there was a playoff game last season with San Jose and, uh, St. Louis where Eric, Car Eric Carlson, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, basically made a hand pass and it resulted in the overtime goal and those plays aren't reviewable and the goal stood mm -hmm. and they won the game. So yeah, you don't want that happening. So this kind of coach's challenge, as long as you have the video people, obviously upstairs that are catching it, they could do the coach's challenge for that. Uh, and then another um, example is when the pucks hit the spectator netting. Sometimes the puck just like rolls right off of that netting. I can see the officials. They can't see it. Um, well, and yeah, and the, the players are so fast now too that yeah, if it's, the game is if fast. it's like, yeah, it can, they can just pick it up and, yeah. and I think that did happen, right? Yeah. Like that, yeah. So that was another, that as well. <laughs> it's just so funny because it should, all happened last year's playoffs. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, uh, Columbus and Boston, the Panarin goal, um, Basically, yeah, it came off the netting so fast and it went right onto his stick, <laughs> into our and into the net. and then into the net, right? So um, now it's just fortunate that it yeah. didn't result in in these team in the like I, we we know that St. Louis did go on to play yeah, in the Stanley obviously. Cup. Boston did beat Columbus, yeah. So it didn't um, hamper their um, opportunities for advancement yeah. however it, it could have though depending yeah. yeah yeah so um one okay so that's the rule change now the interesting thing is that if the coach's challenge is wrong is unsuccessful mm -hmm. it, there's actually going to be a steeper penalty normally it's just the you lose your time out right but in this case the team is actually if you're wrong on the call you're actually gonna get a delay game penalty and then if, if you're wrong again, if you're wrong again, <laughs> you're, you're going to get, get a double, double minor, minor penalty. So there, are so, they doing away completely with that, um, with the losing the timeout? The, that's the way I understood it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That says, uh, like I'm reading it word for word here saying that a team will be able to exercise a coach's challenge at any time, but with escalating consequences for unsuccessful challenges, it will no longer result it will no longer result be based on the availability of a team's time out. So it's not based on the time out. Wow. Yeah. So that's pretty harsh. So I think that what they want is obviously to not be challenging like cuz there's a lot of offside yeah. calls and like, it just that delays the such, game. Yeah. So tight 
that yeah, yeah. it's just going to delay the game so yeah. basically they're going to make this so that it's it's definitely a deterrent to just keep going to the challenge all the time yeah and then the next uh major rule change that i f- think is going to be interesting is to do with the face-offs following an icing and to begin a power play so following an icing so when you when basically the team is trying to relieve pressure and they they want to dump it down the ice from their defensive zone to cross the three lines um they're basically the team will have the choice the offensive team will have the choice as to which zone dot the face-off will take place Mm -hmm. so that is interesting because many coach or majority of coaches around the league, they always want their centermen on their strong side to take the face off. So in this case, you're going to get to choose which face off dot, whether it be the left side right. or the right side. Um, and that also applies to the start of a power play. So when you're on the start of the power play, you can choose which side you want the draw. So that actually could really add some interesting strategies. Yeah. Yeah, in the game. So those are a few things to look out for in the in mm-hmm. the rules. And like I said, go to NHL.com. There are others. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to go through that. And uh, But these are the ones that I think that will stand out for most fans anyways. Yeah. And the other thing is, I guess, that I was happy to hear was to do with the CBA, the Collective Bargaining Agreement. And we're going to have three years of labor peace through to the end of the 2021-22 season. So Yay! We that's like exciting. Peace. The players didn't want to... They did not exercise their option to open it up. And from all accounts, the Players Association and NHL will be um, basically uh, continuing the negotiation to hopefully maybe not even have to worry about this. Yeah, so uh, if they can extend it, that yeah. would be... I think that's definitely in the best interest of the league and the owners for sure because they're going to have Seattle starting soon. That's going to bring more revenue and possibly... That's going to help the the players as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. The more revenue, the better for everyone, I guess. Oh, yeah. That's all they're in it for. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, yep. Enjoy opening night and celebrate having a captain. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, so we'll see who that w- will be. Yeah. And then you can look forward to hearing from us again um, in November when we recap the first month for you. So yeah. this has been Ladies Talking Leaves. Thanks for listening. Go Leafs, go!